In the previous video, I introduced my idea of four cultures, magic art, religious science, as being like a compass pointing in four directions that can help you find a way around. What I didn't deal with is the idea that there could be a sequence that one could follow after the other, and that's what I'm dealing with in this video. When I was at school, I was interested in magic. And yet I was told it was something that didn't exist. But in the school I went to, there was the science department had a fantastic collection of books on magic and alchemy. Ancient books going right back to um, before the days of printing. And so the question came to me, so if magic doesn't exist, why are all these books about it? Why are people thinking about it? And the sort of stock answer of the time um, I parodied along these lines, oh, our ancestors were primitive. They didn't know what we do. And so they did silly things, you know, like dancing to make it rain, drawing pictures of antelopes on a cave wall in order to make it easier to catch them and things like that. And doing silly things like that is what we call magic. Now, if you keep on doing silly things for a very long time, uh, you begin to do it rather well. Doing silly things well is what we call art. And if you continue for thousands of years doing silly things rather well, you begin to do them with real authority. And doing silly things with authority is called religion. But fortunately, sometime in the 19th century, we realised how silly we've been and we woke up and um, now we do science. And we know where we are. Now that's the sort of quick parody of um, a theory which has actually got much more to it. But it wasn't until 1993, the Cheltenham Literary Festival, that there was a, I went to a talk by Philippe Fernandez El Mesto, an uh, Oxford philosopher, I think he was, and he gave a similar story, but he based it on the idea of our changing um, rules for deciding whether something is true or not. And his suggestion that with the earliest, oldest way, the truth test, was, does it feel right? Yeah. Does this idea feel true, whereas that one doesn't? And that this could be the basic thinking um, uh, from the earliest sort of magical way of looking at the world. Certain things just felt right. Now, when people socialise and build up societies and come together and win groups, that grows the idea of certain people knowing more than others. The idea that there's authority. And this became the better test of truth. You know, did it come from a reliable source? Was it the chieftain or the high priest? Or if it was an inner revelation, was it just you being imaginative or was it the voice of God? Um, this became the measure, superior measure of truth. Then came the idea um, that reasoning was the measure of truth. Typified by, you know, in the Middle Ages, the scholastics um, and these great debates uh, based on um, Aristotelian logic, you know, proof of God whether it exists or not. Um, if the thing didn't stand up to rigorous logical argument, then it can't be true. Now, Science has gone a stage further because you can have something which is a perfectly logical, consistent um, model, but it still might not be the truth. The thing to do is to test it and observe the results. So the truth test we now have at last is observation. Now, Fernando Mesto wasn't saying that, you know, all the others are obsolete. Um, you know, for instance, in academia, um, uh, authority is still a very important um, tooth test. You know, if you, your um, thesis, if it quotes lots of people who are recognised authorities, that's good, you know. It, it, um, so, you know, the other forms still exist, but really the peak is to give it the empirical scientific test of observation. Now that particularly interested me, that idea, because of course it related so much to that diagram that I had created for sosotomy. 
because there is magic art, religion and science and there is feeling and thinking sensation which means observation you know actually looking at what your senses to see what they tell you the only difference is I've got the word intuition where he had authority and actually I thought he got the better word for it because um, uh, the reason I was happy with what I put was that um, you know when an intuition feels like the word of God speaking to you it's very authoritative so you know chosen that but I think authority is a better thing in that position so um, I was very happy with this idea of um, the sort of rise from magical up to scientific thinking um, why well funny enough it was because it felt right <laughs> now you see it wasn't observation I wasn't in a position to look back and actually see the evolution of thinking of humanity and um, see this happening. Um, there's a certain sort of, it makes sense, but it isn't a strictly logical thing that I could say this had to happen and, and it couldn't have happened in any other way. There is authority there because um, Fernandez Imesto is a an authority on the subject, so, um, but that wasn't actually the reason why I accepted it. I was prepared to argue about it. It was because it felt right. And the reason it felt right is that I'd gone through something like this in my growing up. I'd gone through that experience, that evolution. Of course, I can't remember much about being a baby before I could speak. But I had a son and um, I've seen other babies and I can see something like magical thinking in the way they come to terms with the world. Finding patterns and reacting and finding what works in response to those patterns. But what I can say is that um, following that, when I learned to speak and um, uh, was beginning to socialise, I definitely became a little artist. For me it wasn't um, pictures on the fridge door, but, uh, you know, Mummy, Mummy, I've seen a moomin troll peeping out from under the roots of the tree. Ooh, you know, well, did you, my dear? Um, uh, you know, this sort of wonderful imagination and, and seeing things and telling little fibs, you know, to make them interesting and all that. And then I went through a sort of classic thing of, I know, age 9, 10, 11, of suddenly getting very serious about life and being a little boy kneeling by the bed and praying and so on and so forth. And then, of course, I, I um, went to the boarding school and got a scientific education. And, oh, what fun we had ribbing the scripture teacher and saying, you know, oh, prove us that God exists, you know, and um, science has shown this isn't true, and so on and so forth. So I remember and I have experienced going through that, that same evolution. The only thing is that um, following that at Cambridge, with the wonderful university library and all of Alistair Crowley's collected works there and um, his letters to and from the um, librarian about his stuff, everything. I became much more interested in magic. Um, and it also makes me wonder about, you know, the earliest stage, that begin this assumption the baby begins with magical thinking. Because in a way, at that stage, scientific thinking is, is even more basic. You see, my model is, uh, you know, the little kid sitting on his high stool and he pushes the spoon to the edge of the table and ding it falls to the floor and mummy comes and picks it up and puts it back and this happens over and over and over again I think what the baby is doing is proto-science okay it isn't a grand you know there's no great theory there or anything but the baby is observing repeatable patterns and how completely they repeat and how you can now push other things to the edge of the table and they will fall down. That is really basically crude scientific thinking. Now, then something happens because there is another repeatable element there, the mother that picks up the spoon. But the thing is that mother isn't quite as reliable as the spoon. Sometimes she picks up straight away, but after a while she begins to get slower and slower about it. And sometimes she washes it before putting it back. 
and eventually she may actually leave it on the floor. Something's gone wrong. And this is where I think the baby could make a very radical experimental step forward. What if inside mother there was another me? You see, um, I'm pretty pissed off with mother because you didn't pick up that spoon. But what if she was pissed off with me? That could explain it. It's a whole new way of tackling this more complex problem. And um, you've really got now a sort of division. Either you can go along the lines of just treating the other person as a more complex mechanism, and you've got to find how to press their buttons and get them to work, or whether to put chemicals in their brains or whatever. Or else you can, and the religious people would call it trading soul. You can put a bit of your soul into the other person and think, what would I do if I was in their position? And the interesting thing, you can extend this. You know, perhaps daddy has got a me in him too. Perhaps the family pet might have this consciousness like me that I can then um, see it being jealous or whatever. And of course, this is, this is really the basis of a lot of magical thinking. You know, the weather's a bit moody today. Um, how can I relate to it to improve its mood? Um, and uh, the whole business of um, demons and talking to trees and so on and so forth, which I wrote up, I wrote up this idea at length in the little book of demons. Now, you see, in both those cases, it's beginning to look as though magic might not be so much pre-scientific as post-scientific. You see, the joy for the scientists of that sort of, um, you know, the, the linear view, which has got, begins with magic and goes up and up and up until now at last we've got science, it puts magic and science at the far end of the spectrum, far away from each other. Whereas my diagram, drop with my diagram, it, oops, it puts magic next door to science rather embarrassingly close and I'm even suggesting that magic happens after science well from there I went to a sort of a cyclic view and I wrote it up um, in, in Sosokmi I, I write that up at length and I make various deductions and one of the most interesting is that we are on the, in the process now of making a major shift from scientific culture to into magical culture, which I'm sure pleases a lot of people. Um, but when I first, in the first edition, I sort of rather um, wrote this up rather playfully because I was aware that once you start talking about cycles of history, um, uh, the scientific culture does not like that. You are a crank if you talk in terms of cycles. So I played it down a bit. And I'm not going to sort of go into any more depth on it now. Um, except just from one point of view, as to why should things go around in cycles rather than this nice straight linear progression which gets us to the point of what is really true. And I'll only suggest, make one suggestion, and that is that um, to move towards one point of perfection is actually not very good for evolutionary survival. Um, and I think that people have a feeling for this because in the 50s, which was a time of very great um, rationalist um, uh, supremacy, um, there was this whole sort of genre of science fiction stories and movies where uh, a super intelligent race descends from the sky and um, attacks mankind and that um, uh, they've got the most amazing technology they're far more intelligent than us and yet somehow we defeat them and it usually ended up with sort of um, uh, well they knew everything they had mastered reason but the one thing they didn't understand was love or 
They thought with absolute intelligence they could conquer us, but they could not allow for the sheer doggedness of a one man's willpower, or whatever. In those stories, there was a real sort of feeling that um, uh, beware of 100% rational intelligence. It's going to be an evolutionary dead end. If you put all your eggs into that one basket, um, you're in for trouble. And I think that's the sort of gut feeling that people had, and I think there's something in it. I think that actually the churn of going through these different um, human attributes, moving from one to the other, is a, uh, is a survival thing. But I just put that forward um, as an idea. <laughs> If you like my theory of cycles, follow it up and have fun with it. <laughs>